Well, thank you very much for coming along again here to our program on EcoViews and News. We are, in fact, working on a premise that we started the last time on restoring natural ecosystems. We have with us again this evening Jim Lowry, who is a bit of an expert on all of these issues, uh, both on terrestrial ecosystems and in the oceans. And tonight we're going to look a bit more at the oceans question. What's been going wrong with the ecosystems in the oceans? We've actually been getting a series of reports on that recently, and um, you've probably seen some of them. Some of them have been available on places like YouTube, and we can actually call up and look at some of the public reporting on this. Let's take a look. Bringing the people behind our food to life. So how healthy are the oceans today? What we've seen with some major studies of, of the U.S. oceans in the last several years, the Pew Commission and the U.S. Ocean Commission both found the same thing, that the oceans are in dire straits, that we basically overfished, we've polluted, we've damaged habitat, we've uh, taken animals out, we've changed things, and I add to that climate change and you've lost kind of the natural resilience in some of these systems. It's, you know, been done on our watch in the last 50 years or so with industrial methods of fishing and fish farming. And we're, we're in some serious trouble. We're almost at a tipping point of we could lose most of our wild stocks by 2048 is the project projection of some scientists. If we continue where we're going, we could see a, a total collapse of fish populations. A total collapse of fish populations. Now, this is pretty, uh, pretty sobering. Uh, the notion is that uh, if you continue the way we're going, there's an old Chinese proverb that says, if you don't change direction, you'll probably end up where you're going. <laughs> <laughs> and that's pretty sobering when you think of the uh, circumstance we're up again in the ocean, because if we don't change direction, we'll probably end up in the projected state of affairs that this woman talks about, mm -hmm. um, a kind of depleted oceans by the year uh, 48, basically, I mean, 2048 is not very far ahead of here. So we've got to start thinking and talking with people like uh, Jim Laurie and Seth Itzkan, who've worked a lot on these issues um, and fortunately are with us this evening to uh, talk about them. So let's um, turn it over to Jim and um, see what we can learn. Uh, yeah, thanks, Tim, uh, for this chance. Uh, um, yeah, that was quite sobering to hear about the, the fish populations and so forth. Um, the first slide I've got here is uh, thinking about extinction. And Peter Ward, who's a paleontologist out at the University of Washington, um, wrote this article for Scientific American. And he was discussing um, what the steps might be to an extinction episode. And uh, as you can, if you can see that, that's a little hard to see. But if, in, the, in the ocean part, down below the surface, you can see that the the water's blue until it starts turning green and then even brown and that's essentially the, an area where sulfur chemistry starts to predominate and if the oceans can't breathe it just starts building up a lot of hydrogen sulfide and there have been times in the past when the hydrogen sulfide actually explodes out of the ocean and goes up into the atmosphere and this is uh, really toxic to life above the surface too and uh, so one of the things I've been thinking about a lot is how do we help the oceans breathe? If we lose the ice, that would be really bad. And, um, you know, that wouldn't, wouldn't help it very much. You can see the, the, this slide here. Uh, losing the ice is, is important if you're, if, if you're looking for an imminent extinction episode, losing the ice is one way to do it. I've checked that off. Yeah, that happened. Uh, soil loss, if your rivers are muddy and there's a lot of oxygen demand going into the ocean, um, that would help uh, build dead zones, and I checked that one off. That's happening. Uh, ocean dead zones are increasing. Uh, we see that in a lot of places. And the loss of biodiversity uh, in the world, um, those are all happening. The one that we're not sure of yet is ocean anoxia, the loss of oxygen. Is Are we going to get uh, a lot of hydrogen sulfide coming out of the ocean? So then Peter Ward, uh, in 2007, after the Scientific American article, came to the conclusion that CO2 is the driver of extinction episodes. When CO2 rises rapidly, 
uh, you lose the ice and this process starts happening. It's been shown to be almost every extinction episode except when the dinosaurs died. And so it was kind of a scary book, but he felt like he had to write it and get it out to the public. And uh, um, I read that two years ago, and that's what kind of started me on this quest to figure out how to restore the oceans. And um, so this was what, when I was here two weeks ago, I showed this slide, and it talked about how to put carbon back in the soils from the atmosphere. And if you do that, it'll also stabilize the soils. So the amount of runoff, you know, instead of having uh, most of your water run off, it would go into the soils because these are now carbon rich and so forth. And so I thought that was an important thing to be talking about. But that's not what we're going to talk about today. That was in the previous. So um, so how do we help the oceans to breathe? And um, as, the, as the tapes showed, most large predator fish are disappearing. The cod, even though we haven't really fished them very much in the last 10 years, have never recovered. And algae blooms and dead zones are increasing. So now we've got too much algae and not enough predators. So what is missing? And as you can see, um, the algae-eating fish. That's uh, sardines, anchovies, menhaden. These are really, really critical, and I think that I think that's a weak link. Uh, you know, if if um, I mean, we might be overfishing predators, but if the predators had more to eat, we'd have a have a chance. And uh, so, how do we help them get more to eat? So, and this is the guy. This is the menhaden. This used to be the most important fish in the sea. Uh, it's an expert at converting algae to oil and, and protein. And uh, it's not very good for humans to eat. It doesn't taste very good, too oily. But it's incredibly good for everybody else. So let's uh, see the... Um, Bruce Franklin was a... He liked to fish for bluefish. He was a professor down at uh, Rutgers, uh, English professor was wondering why the bluefish were having such a hard time and started studying what bluefish like to eat. And he called this book The Most Important Fish in the Sea. Um, so it was probably outnumbered all the other fisheries combined in most years. So uh, John Smith, uh, when he came to the Chesapeake, said there were just so many Menhaden, he didn't know how to, you know, it was they were just running at the top, as you can see, lying so thick, their heads above the water. So, so trying to catch them with a frying pan, that, that would look like it wouldn't be an easy, easy task. So. And then this is the story I grew up with as a kid, you know, and probably in New England you really hear this a lot. Squanto actually rode back from England with uh, John Smith, and when the pilgrims showed up, he was helping them, you know, they, they were noticing that they were starving, and they thought, well, this is kind of silly, you know, they and uh, if they want to grow corn, they can use fish as a fertilizer. And the fish were undoubtedly menhaden. You know, there were, you can see the Narragansett Indian Munahatik, or Abenaki. They talk, they call them what now Mainers call them pogies. So that's um, that's the fish we want to see come back. So, and here's uh, as Seth says, prodigious algae eaters. Colossal vacuum cleaner. Four gallons of water per minute goes go through these fish uh, when, uh, on an average size. Uh, imagine if you had billions of them moving around the Gulf of Maine, and that's what used to happen. So, so I mean, systemically, if you look at the system and the predation chain, these fish are the algae eaters. They're the ones who are one step up removed from photosynthesis. And if we're having a bloom of algae, uh, one way to get rid of it would be to get rid of the toxins or the pollutants that are in effect causing it, and the nutrient flux, as it's often referred to. That is, if you if you uh, send excessive nitrogen or potassium or um, phosphorus into the coastal areas by runoff from from land areas, you can often see algae blooms because some of them are phosphorus limited or, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or nitrogen limited and the like. And when you change that nutrient flux, then you can expect the algae to show up that are limited by that resource. Um, but the other way to get rid of them is not just to get rid of what's coming in from the ocean, but to provide algae eaters. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And these are the algae eaters you're suggesting. Absolutely. So they can basically um, biologically 
keep head of the uh, the algae blooms by, in effect, converting uh, photosynthesis products, that is, the algae, into oils. Mm -hmm. In effect, they're, they're the food conversion step in the uh, trophic level that moves things from from the photosynthesis to the stored uh, energy in complex oil systems. Now there is a weak link though. If you're an algae eater, you're depending on sunlight. You're a grazer. Right. So you have to go south in the wintertime. Interesting. And so we always wondered why did the Menhaden disappear? Why, why did all these stocks have trouble in the Grand Banks and in the Gulf of Maine before we noticed them having trouble farther south? I well see. the Menhaden had to go south where the algae was. Uh -huh. And uh, Rachel Carson described this in the 1940s, that she would notice that mackerel would come north in the spring right. while they were following the Menhaden. And mackerel don't come as, you know, in as big a numbers as they used to. They don't have as right. much to eat. And sardines migrate too in a in the similar way. And in mm -hmm. fact, they're uh, mm -hmm. moving, uh, we think of it as in reference to ocean currents. But in fact, ocean currents reflect uh, thermal differentiation, so they're moving either north or south depending upon how the tilt of the, the earth is uh, organized. Mm -hmm. And we often see evidence of the movement of sardines up, say, off the coast of Africa um, because we can watch the migrating birds that live on the sardines oh, yeah. there go. as they move after them, in a sense. We see that above the water. Uh, while well, their food supply is moving up <laughs> along Every, the coast. Everything has a, yeah, everything's thinking about food. That's interesting. <laughs> wow. Well, so. I guess if you <laughs> saw the feeding and the breeding strategies, you mm -hmm. pretty much understood how the ecosystem works. But the periodicity of it is very interesting mm -hmm. in reference to uh, the migrations having to do with the change in temperature. Mm -hmm. So you know, expect that any long-term change in temperatures, either of the oceans or of the air, uh, is likely to have impact on currents, which is likely to have impact on the distribution of species as well. Mm -hmm. um, far and away the nation's largest, largest fishery, northeast stocks were decimated first. Why? Well, that's why. They, they, um, when they went south, uh, well, after World War II, uh, with all these Navy pilots looking for jobs, they decided to fish, you know, they, they, they use uh, airplanes to find out where the Menhaden schools were, and they were huge. They were the size of counties sometimes. Wow. And so um, they'd go out and they figured out a way to do a per seine net to the extent where they could just essentially get all of them. Right. And, the, and the, after a while the schools got smaller and smaller. And if you're a Menhaden and you're in a small school, uh, you can't eat, you know, you can't eat up all the algae that's down south anymore. And right. so the idea of having to go north to get what you need to eat, um, you know, as the numbers diminished, they didn't come north as much as they used to. So, Yeah, this is interesting. Um, you'd expect that there'd be a greater, greater mass of biomass further down the food chain. So if you are the algae eaters, the first ones off the mm -hmm. photosynthetic step, as it were, sure. that mm -hmm. should be the largest. And sure enough, it did amount to more weight than any of the combined Mm -hmm. uh, fisheries from there on up in the trophic chain. But if you eliminate that, you're going to eliminate a lot of things, including um, fish further up the, the trophic chain. So mm -hmm. it's a very interesting uh, combination of, um, you know, the disappearance of a lower level in the food chain and then its ramifications later on in the fin fish, mm -hmm. as it was called here. So here's uh Here's the thing I want to see. I want to see the cod come back to Stelwigan Bank in huge numbers. Um, they used to be here. And um, the idea of walking to shore on the heads of the great fish, you know, that's quite an interesting idea that you can't move your boat through the water because there were too many fish in the way. But uh, what did the cod eat? You know, and, and of course the next slide uh, kind of shows, uh, well, let, let's look at this. How many how many fish are there? You got Menhaden eating algae, and then everybody else is eating Menhaden. Okay, here's the uh, Menhaden algae connection. Mm -hmm. They eat the algae. So if there are algae blooms, and there aren't any persons, <laughs> as it were, in the food chain eating okay. them, then you'd expect the algae blooms to get bigger and bigger. If there were predators on the algae, if you want to consider it that way, in the uh, trophic chain of things. Then you'd expect the Menhaden population to expand 
providing a food supply for everything from cod mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. mackerel uh, to bonito. Well, go ahead. I mean, yeah. tell us the links here. This, well, the sacred cod, as it says up there. That, uh, <laughs> one thing about cod is that they tend to be bottom feeders. If there's stuff coming to the bottom, they'll they'll do that. And if if you imagine that you're, you're a menhaden and you're being chased, you you're, you school as much as possible to try to protect the herd, so to speak. It's very similar to, to what happens on the grasslands, you know, where everybody herds together when there's predators around. So the bass are chasing you and the bluefish are chasing you and uh, and even swordfish get into this, you know, is, um, so, so just imagine all this commotion and half-eaten menhaden end up down in the bottom and this is when the cod seem to thrive. They didn't have to get into it all. They can get plenty to eat right there. They get the leftovers. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> So that's, uh, that's my, my theory anyway, and uh, I, I think uh, this is the fish we need to have come back in, in huge numbers. I think if we were to ban fishing menhaden, um, this could help all the other fish. And you say, well, what about the menhaden fishery? Well, that's now being done by one company that employs maybe 300 fishermen in Virginia. And uh, so I, I'd say, well, why don't all the other fisheries buy out menhaden? fishery and just say that you can't uh, use big boats to, to catch menhaden anymore. Yeah, that whole idea that you suggested here of applying modern technology to fishing is a very interesting structural problem. In effect, if they're using planes to scot, uh, spot schools of fish and then going in with uh, mm -hmm. these very um, tightly meshed nets to harvest them, this is um, high-tech wedded with hunting and gathering, <laughs> and uh, it's devastating if you combine mm -hmm. the two. Mm -hmm. I mean, hunter-gatherer economies usually worked on bows and arrows and, and traps and, and uh, yeah. occasional fish weirs, you didn't right? Try to, you didn't try to catch everything. <laughs> right. A fish weir would, would be put across a tributary, mm -hmm. and certain fish would be caught, but you weren't wiping out the whole migrating sure. fish uh, sure. crowd. Um, but if you combine high tech with the logic of culling, mm. then you can probably be more successful than you really want to be in the long run because in effect the whole point of migrating species is that yes, you can put yourself in the middle of the migration and cull off a certain amount of it, but if you're more successful than they are in reproducing themselves, with the remaining that get through your traps or nets or fish lines or, mm -hmm. or the like, um, then you'll do yourself out of business in an accelerated mm -hmm. way. Here's where an example of the old adage, well, give them a fish and they can stay alive today, teach them how to fish and they can stay alive forever only if <laughs> you keep the level of fishing you have to have below a, the reproductive uh, level of that species. And you have to have a grazing plan like, yeah. like the when the ranchers learned the grazing plans, uh, the grass came back. And exactly. This is, this is a, so well, th this, is a, this is a quick show of the Mississippi watershed, but mostly you look at how huge it is, you know, how much nutrients are coming off of it with all the nitrogen and fertilizer and the pesticides and so forth. And then look at the big red area, which is on the next slide. And uh, this is uh, essentially a dead zone. And they used to say the dead zone uh, down in Louisiana, Nancy Robillet would talk about the dead zone the size of New Jersey, and New Jersey complained. <laughs> so they changed it and said it's now the size of Massachusetts. I see. And um, you see, this, this is the, the best fishery in the United States, and now fish trying to get to the wetlands of Louisiana to have their babies have to go through an area where they can't breathe. Ah. And uh, and the Menhaden are essentially the numbers down there are fished uh, relentlessly, and um, you know so that's another factor. And you know one, there's too many nutrients coming in, and two, there's uh, fish that might save the situation, having a really rough time. So this is another. This is a study of hypoxia in the Chesapeake Bay, and uh, if you look at the chart there, there's two colors on it, and one is hypoxia, which is below two parts per million oxygen which Menhaden can do okay in, but a lot of fish have problems. And then you notice that it's starting to be anoxia, which is no oxygen at all. And now it's like 40% of the bay, and see how fast it's growing over the, over the decades. Um, another thing is that oysters can't handle this kind of stuff, but oysters once filtered Chesapeake Bay every three days. So imagine that. Now it's maybe once a year, 
and the oysters, uh, they're trying to learn how to grow oysters at the top of the water column rather than at the bottom, you know, which is silly. But, uh, you know, the other thing is that they talk about rockfish, which are striped bass in the Chesapeake. And when they open up rockfish now, a lot of them are sick, and they find out they're trying to eat blue crab. Now imagine trying to digest a blue crab versus a, uh, an oil-rich uh, menhaden, and it's, it's giving them a hard time. So. And then this is uh, maybe the ultimate uh, dead zone. This is off the coast of Namibia, and you look at it, satellite picture, there's, there's not much development in Namibia. It's a desert. And uh, the, the yellowish, kind of greenish-yellowish area is a, a hydrogen sulfide uh, explosion that we talked about in the first slide. Is, uh, they're actually getting hydrogen sulfide coming out of uh, the ocean. And uh, why? Why is this? What's going on? The rotten egg smell. This is not, uh, not, not a good sign, because we said that if you want to have an extinction episode, this is one of the things you would see. Yes, that will cause extinctions on land um, with the blanketing. It, uh, it's a gas that is pretty heavy and it will hang over, mm -hmm. in effect, areas that it uh, emerges from the ocean on, uh, in coastal areas, and it will kill. And then the next slide shows, uh, if you look at the bottom of the uh, map there on each one, and uh, it says the town of, Lut I'm trying to think, Lut Luteritz, something like that, Germanic name. Mm -hmm. But you notice that's where they smelled the, the sulfur, and they asked the satellite to take pictures, and they thought they might see something, and it turned out what they saw was that the explosion mm -hmm. was like three, at least three uh, latitude lines long. So it was over 200 miles along the coast, which they never expected. Uh, it was quite an extensive. So what is happening out there? Well, one of the things that's happening is that they used to have a huge fishery out there because of all the Antarctic currents crashing against the Arctic, against the African coast. And uh, a lot of the big fish have disappeared, and it's because of the sardine fishery. There's so many sardines caught off the African coast now to go to Europe that, uh, that the whole food web's dying, and now we're seeing explosions in uh, sulfur. They're seeing they're seeing similar things off the coast of Oregon, and there's sardines in California have been pretty much fished out too, so. Oh boy. <laughs> so here we are. We need a grazing plan for the ocean, and one for the land. So it's consistent with what you told us about uh, last time, namely reorganizing our presence on the land to restore the food chains through restoration of soil, and in fact, the capturing of carbon in the soil, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but also the revivification of all the grass systems that were present on the American plains. Um, and similarly, what you need to do is a grazing plan for the ocean, you're suggesting here, to keep in effect every level of the chains moving. <laughs> yeah, so exactly. you don't get this explosion of algae on the one hand by restoring some of the algae eaters, and then uh, Oh, there, there she is. There's my favorite skater, and she's, she knows uh, Russian enough to say, uh, more ice, please, in, in Russian. Right. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, if we can get the carbon out of the air and get the ice to return, that would help the system incredibly much. So, so you're suggesting, basically, if we continue the direction we're going in, uh, we'll probably end up where we're going, which is toward these massive extinctions. But we can resist that by turning around these systems. Let's make soil, you suggest, <laughs> and let's bring back the, the Menhaden, bring back the sardines. And hopefully Sasha will uh, win the Olympics, too, so that would be good. <laughs> so. Well, there's a lot of information on this available through um, either Jim Laurie or Seth Itzkan at uh, gmail.com and Planet Tech Associates. So we'll be putting these things up on the website that you can follow up on and look at this whole logic of restoration ecology for massive systems to re-equilibrate uh, the balances of life forms and life itself on the ecosystem. Thanks very much for coming along.